Welcome, friends, to another edition of Tiffin Box TV. I'm your host, Seishu, and I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. Today's guest is a good friend of mine. His name is Eric Francis. He's based in Omaha, Nebraska, and he's a photographer and a phenomenal visual storyteller, helping clients in all aspects of industry there, talking about their I don't know, their businesses, their lifestyle. I mean, this guy does it all, and it does it so well. Um, one of the things I also have to tell you about Eric is uh, he's, he's sort of a mentor to me because when I sh shifted from using DSLRs primarily and wanted to use a Fuji system, a Fuji film system, this is the guy who helped me out. So thanks to Eric, I am now a Fuji film photographer as well. Welcome to the show. Well, it's about time. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Indeed, isn't it? Um, yep. Listen, uh, Eric, I know you have had a long history in this business. You've been at this for a while. Uh, yes. you've, you've shoot a variety of sports, not just sports, but, you know, business events and things like that as well. And I want to know a little bit about uh, you in terms of your history. Tell us a little bit how you got started in this business, this crazy business mm. of ours. Uh, and why you love photography so much? Well, I started off uh, in college wanting to be uh, a photojournalist. You know, we, you all had those those dreams where you picked up your photo books and you had the, the Cartier Bressons and the David Allen Harveys and the, the, the Sam Abels and all those guys that you just, you know, that's the lifestyle I wanted to live. You know, as a young 20-something mm -hmm. adventure, I wanted to go have adventure. Mm -hmm. And you go work for a small newspaper, and you start working your way through the news business. And um, eventually, my wife at the time uh, got a job back here in Omaha, and we were tired of the small-town newspaper thing. So I just came back here and started freelancing as a news photographer. Awesome. Um, and, and, and it worked. There was enough work here. Some of my contacts at the... The local paper um, really helped me out, awesome, and, and and kept me kept me going. And uh, you know, you, over time, you start picking up some some commercial clients and and to really pay the bills. Yeah, so indeed. That you can afford so that you can afford to play news photographer on the weekends, kind of thing. <laughs> and um, I know exactly kind of what a, you're talking it's about. Kind of yeah, it's yeah. kind of evolved from there. So yeah. awesome, um, awesome. And you got you you've been you know you you transitioned from obviously using film cameras to using digital SLRs. How was that transition for you? I was actually, I made the decision in around the year 2000, I think it was, right? right yeah, right at the turn there. Um, I sold three or two Leica M6s and three lenses to finance my first digital camera that cost me over $8,000. Oh, and a couple wow. and a couple batteries and yeah, four megapixel camera that's collecting dust in the garage right now. Um, well, some, someday, I, Eric, I, someday, Eric, but, these are going to be worth a lot of money. You never know, right? Well, you never know. Some museum, museum might want it. Yeah. But at the time, I was the only freelancer in the greater region here from a pretty big area. I was the only freelancer that was digital. Is that right? Um, wow. Yeah. So uh, it really put a shot into my career at the time. Um, being the only freelancer around, you know, yeah. I was getting a lot of, a lot of, uh, AP and Getty and, and newspaper work. And, you know, once everybody found out that, Hey, there's this guy in the middle of the country freelancer that can shoot digital and get us our stuff fast. You know, it, you, you were the go-to guy. Worked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> That's then, great. You know, we had to, for the next, you know, you'd say next five to eight years, you know, it, the business changed a lot really fast. Tell us about um, that. How did it change? And, well, uh, when we transitioning to as digital cameras, you know, the, the camera companies started getting into it and realized this is where it's going. And they started making them. And, you know, we went from those early what I call Franken cameras, those Kodak, Canon, Kodak, Nikon hybrids to, you know, the D1 and and. Uh, the, what was the Canon one? The 1D? Was it? But anyways. I was never um, a Canon shooter, so I have no you know, idea. But, we, but we, we went through those 
you know, we went from the D1 to the D3, it seemed like, overnight. Yeah. But those early, when I think back on it, those early years were, those were painful. You know, Canon, Nikon was still trying to figure out how to get autofocus to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> really well. Yeah. And Canon was picking butt and, and, but it was still painful trying to figure out your uh, workflow and get photos done. And, you know, photo mechanic was, came along and saved us all a ton of work and, and, you know, she knew, it seemed like we bought a new laptop every, geez, every year almost. Right. Because they, you know, and, and it, it was a painful time to work through at, at times. Yeah. You know, it was painful. Mega, it was painful. Megapixel cameras. Right. And, and it was high, slow. High ISO was 1600, you know. Right, right. And now I hear people complaining when their their files don't look awesome at at 12.5. And I'm just, I just kind of roll my eyes. I'm like, oh, geez, I have no idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Indeed, indeed, yeah. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's why, you know, when, when I see that, um, you know, a lot of, I remember a lot of film photographers, you know, rolling their eyes at digital photography, you know, that, oh, it'll never, it'll never, 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 you know, and <clears throat> there was a film company that took that attitude and I don't think they exist anymore. Yeah. We all know which one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, Eric, I think what, what I, what I'm hearing from you is that you were number one, an early adopter. You were not afraid to just jump in and try something new and exciting and, and, and you served your clients very well because of your uh, risk uh, taking, I guess, in, in, in some respects. It was, I mean, $8,000 camera is no chump change, you know, right? Right. And even though you had to sell off the Leica equipment, which hurts my soul oh. to hear, I'm That's sure it hurts painful. yours. Uh, you know, the fact is you jumped in and you made something happen out of it. And that's fun that's really a, a, a sort of a take home point for a lot of photographers that, who are on the fence about moving to either new new gear or even new opportunities, really. I mean, just jump in and start doing it and things will happen. Number two, I, I'm also hearing from you um, is that uh, you've you've not just adopted new technology and said, okay, this is it, but you've also adapted to the newer technology that's coming down the, mm -hmm. the plot. So let's talk about your transition from using those slow uh, DSLRs to maybe faster DSLRs to now mirrorless cameras. We're talking about Fujifilm cameras, of course, right. uh, which as an introduction, I said, you inspired me to start using more and more. And, you know, I moved from an X100 T at, at that time to now an XT2, and right. it's made a significant difference in the way I conduct my business. I mean, the workflow is faster, simpler, the colors are beautiful, everything is just wonderful about it. But what what is what was it about? What was about the the Fujifilm system that excited you? That you said, okay, I'm going to leave behind the DSLRs and go to Fuji. What was that moment? You go, ah, I'm done. Well, with there DSLRs. were there were a couple moments. Um... Originally, I bought an X Pro One from a friend, and I was just going to use it for, you know, like a lot of people say they do. They're just, I'm just going to use it for happy snaps on the weekend and kids yeah. and vacations and families. And I remember the moment, the first time, the first images that came up on the computer, it, it, I was floored. Yeah, as to how good they looked. Um, it reminded me. And there aren't too many people that are going to get this moment. But when you used to take your slide film and throw it down on a light table and those colors would pop, pop at you yep. and you would just there was that sense of, wow, yep. every single time. Yes. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter how many rolls of film you shot. Yeah. When it when it was exposed right, and it looked well. It just and it popped. There was that wow factor. And I had that same wow factor. And the term I came up with that at the time is it was. It was about as organic a feeling as you could get from digital. It felt very organic, like film, and and felt very real. So I start, you know, I start taking the camera with me on jobs and doing things, and I found myself delivering a higher, always a higher percentage of Fuji pictures uh, to my clients. Fantastic. And then about that same time, my Nikon gear was getting a little long in the tooth and getting beat up and worn and I was starting to look and think about you know I, I kind of need a system wide update and you know I needed to update my my 70 to 200 and I needed to update you know my D, my D3s and 
and I, it was just time to start thinking about updating. And you start looking at the price tag of updating, you know, and you're like, and I was just like, I started getting very frustrated about what I call that arms race between Canon and Nikon. Right. And they just keep trying to shove more stuff into a camera and charge me twice as much for it. When really I still just need shutter speeds and apertures and some autofocus I can count on and I'm good to go. Um, and about that same time, I started hearing a bunch of people say you can't shoot sports with Fuji. Anybody who knows me knows that that doesn't do anything but spur me on. Right. So I started shooting sports with Fuji just to prove people wrong. And then I started realizing that, holy cow, it can do it. Yeah. You know, um, I'm just waiting on a lens, you know. And then when this past year, when they finally came out with their 100 to 400, which, you know, isn't the most optimum sports lens, but boy, it works. And it did the job. You know, I sat down and I ran the numbers on what I call the return on my return on investment as a business owner. And I could pay for all the, if I did a complete switch, all the, the price of all of my used Nikon gear could pay for brand new Fuji gear. Fantastic. Oh, I just decided to take, to take the leap. I yeah. saw the future coming. It's unavoidable at this point. Right. Anybody that still has their head in the sand. But it's unavoidable. It's coming. The world is is getting is going to get rid of the mirror box here shortly because hmm. there's no need for it anymore. And 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 the in the camera the the fact of the matter is the camera does the job. I I, I agree completely. Um, having shifted from a Nikon system, not fully like you have, but you'll get there partially. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Eric. <laughs> one day, one day, very soon. Very soon. Um, you know. Being able to move to a Fuji film system, and, then, and I'm echoing really a lot of the things you've that you've gone through in that transition. Where you know, maybe this was a few weeks ago when I you know either decided I just wanted to try Fuji film and only Fuji film for my assignment, and I went out there and I shot with the the two lenses I have, the the 23 f2 and the 35 f2 for the XT2. Um, Number one, I the, the, the experience number one of of photographing was significantly different mm -hmm. for me. It was pleasant. It was pleasant. Yeah. Number one, it was pleasant. Number two, I also noticed how my subjects saw me. In the sense, I was photographing in a in a private prep school, mm -hmm. uh, and this is during classes, right? And and being able to photograph in a classroom with a DSLR versus in a classroom with a smaller, quieter X-T2, it's like 180 degrees mm -hmm. difference. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. um, the, the, the people in the classroom simply almost ignore me versus Absolutely. looking around and saying, hey, who's taking pictures here? You know, kind of thing, you know? Right. That is a huge part of, I think, what I love about the Fuji film system as well. It's like it, it, it's inconspicuous. You know, it's just yeah, like you're, absolutely. and it becomes a part of you. And uh, there's so much to say about this, honestly. And it sounds right. like a sounds like I'm a little giddy about it, but because I am. I mean, I really am really excited about it. Um, you have a whole bunch of lenses now. I mean, you have, you have a, a like a, an array of lenses um, that you've acquired since shifting gears into Fujifilm, mm -hmm. uh, a 14 millimeter, a 23, a 35, a 50 F2, which I think you said before we started recording was just amazing, a very sharp yep. lens. Very, very sharp. Um, I'm on the cusp of actually buying a 90 millimeter F2. The 90 might be the sharpest lens they, might be the sharpest lens I've ever owned. Really? That's good to hear. Yeah, it's very, very sharp. Fantastic. And then you have the F, uh, the 50 140 F2.8, mm -hmm. right? Right. Right? And yep. um, and then the 100, 400 that you just mentioned for sports uh, with a with a teleconverter, which is, you know, I think, I mean, if you carry all of that, I, I'm willing to bet, almost bet, that all of those lenses and those cameras that you have probably weigh only about two-thirds of the weight of a DSLR system in your bag, right? Well, even, even, even less. less. Even less. Well, yeah, well, I got rid of my big, huge Nikon sports lens, yeah. which was the bulk of the weight in my camera bag. 
But I did have to. The funny story is, is uh, when I switched, I had to go out and get a new think tank roller bag because I found my my full size uh, airport security was mo- was only about half full of cameras, and the rest <laughs> of it was just stuff. Yes. That I don't necessarily need on every assignment, you know. Ex- I mean? Extra but underwear, I mean, right? Extra, <laughs> d- just extra stuff that you don't need. Yeah. And so I went out and got a, a the, what is it, the Airstream? It's a smaller version of the. Yes. And uh, yeah, and it's the perfect size. Yes. But uh, yeah, as far as weight goes, it's considerably lighter. I mean, I football season this year was a lot more enjoyable. Right. A lot less stress on my body. Right. Right. You know, um, yeah, I just kind of walked around the sidelines giggling the whole time. <laughs> well, I'm, making the, I'm making the pictures, and yeah. it's easy to get around. Right. You know, my favorite, I, you know, all my, my local friends here, my, you know, I kneel down beside them, and I just look over and go, God, that stuff looks really heavy. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, talking about football, you, you photograph Nebraska football, man, and, uh, yeah. you know, I'm looking at... A photograph that you've uh, you've shared with us on your Instagram page, um, which happens to be Instagram.com slash EF Photo Picks. If you guys are interested in checking it out, following Eric and his uh, experiences uh, around Nebraska and beyond, uh, there's a photograph of. Uh, I mean, it is gorgeous, gorgeous photograph of uh, uh, Nebraska football, and you got you got a, like a triptych almost there. Uh, tell us, talk to us a little bit about that. That those sets of photographs, if you don't mind, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you used and how you got got to that point. Most, as far as how I shoot football with the Fuji, yeah, um, I don't shoot it a whole lot different than I did with the DSLR. To tell you the truth, um, the approach is the same. Um, I get to move around a little faster, right? But um, uh, the approach is largely the same. Some tweaks, I try and shoot a little bit tighter now than I may have even before because I don't have that 2.8 depth of field that I would really, really like to have. Mm-hmm. And if Fuji is really making this this telephoto prime that is all rumored all over the place, I am, you're going to see somebody jumping up and down with so much excitement you won't believe it because that's the... The What's the rumor? Percent. Very quickly, tell us a little bit about um, the rumor. I've seen well, it's all over. I've seen it in several discussion groups and all over the place that uh, they're working on a 200 f2. Oh, wow! Um, I, oh, yes, please, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness! Especially wow. for shoot, especially shooting indoor sports and yes. things like that. Yes, yes. But um, even outdoor, to be able to get that depth of field you yeah. know, when you're shooting a field sport would be just heaven. Yes. But so I try and shoot a little bit tighter. A little bit closer to the action than I, than I might have before. Yep. But to tell you the truth, I was starting to get with the DSLRs. It was also good and also easy. It was very easy to just fall into a, into a rhythm, and you could almost do it blindfolded. You know, another football game is another football game. But, let, uh, let me ask you this though, Eric. I mean, one of the things uh, that I think uh, you you know somebody who's considering the leap to a mirrorless system like the Fujifilm option would would ask whether you know do you sometimes have to wait for the action to come to you you know do you are you do you have the lens depth to to really reach for that well, end then, zone so, on the other side of the field well absolutely I mean the 100 to 400 you know everybody likes to do the conversion factor you know if, if you put that in, in like a, a full frame that's like a 600 millimeter lens so yeah, I'm not I'm not missing anything because of because the lens can't get me there. Gotcha. Um, that's for sure. And the autofocus is it's a it's a moot point at this. It really is. The XT2 can absolutely do. I well, you know, I spent this last year since I got my XT2 right before football season, and I did I did football and volleyball and wrestling and swimming and and oh wrestling or what else i've done just about everything this baseball um this year with with that fuji gear and i'm not missing anything that i would probably wouldn't have missed with an icon you know to That's tell you awesome. the truth yeah we just we just don't miss um and it's just a matter of getting the camera set up right 
you got to tweak your your approach just a little bit and i and you and i have talked about that absolutely um, yep. you just have to tweak how you do things a little bit and the camera will just perform it just performs great for me yeah i don't sweat it at all yep. um it's not a question you know i still hear people saying it's not as good as d5 and okay and, and i just kind of whatever those conversations because oh if it, i don't care if it's not as good as a d5 it gets the job done right at a third the cost you know <laughs> return on investment um that's yeah. my biggest thing for the last couple of years of my life is is when i look at my cameras what's the return on investment you know especially in sports photography that may be one of the lowest paying that's right um avenues in photog in the in the photography business but it requires the most expensive gear indeed and is arguably the hardest on said gear yes you know yes you take a 400 28 and a d5 out in the rain and i don't care if it's weather sealed and all of that stuff you still got your your butt's gonna pucker a little bit and you're gonna worry about keeping that thing covered and dry <laughs> yes you know what i mean yeah absolutely because that's twelve thousand yeah. dollars worth of gear yeah at yeah. least yeah. you know um well the lens itself probably is about yeah you, you probably 15 but, close to 15 yeah. yeah but um you know so just return on investment yeah you know if the if the fuji can get the job done which it can what do you get with a d5 right let's let's uh go off on a quick tangent if you don't mind eric um, absolutely in addition to being a photographer you're also I should have introduced you as a teacher, although I sort of hinted at it when I talked to you, talked about you being mentor as a you you came on board as a mentor to me uh, about at least the Fujifilm system. Uh, you are about to teach a workshop on May nineteenth, uh, and it's called Fujifilm Night at the Ballpark. Talk to us about this event. What's going on? Well, we're gonna um, we've been pushing this through some of my Fuji people uh, that I talked to. We've been tossing this idea around for a while, actually. About um, about doing some kind of a more sports centric workshop because they got plenty of they got plenty of street photographers, plenty of plenty of uh, wedding photographers, and lots of portrait photographers, and a couple outstanding uh, uh, travel people that do a pretty some phenomenal work. But there's about two sports photographers that I know of and they primarily shoot racing and a few other things on the side but um, we really didn't have anybody shooting sports sports you know what I call regular sports American ball sports sure you know sure. The, the the trinity of, of, of regular ball sports and uh, and that's what I do a lot of you know when I work for Hell Varsity Magazine so um we wanted to put together some kind of a little workshop, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do a little thing out at the ballpark. Uh, everybody's gonna come out. We're gonna have a couple hours beforehand where we're gonna talk about sports photography in general, um, and then a little bit about baseball. You know about how to shoot baseball, what to be looking for outside of the regular cliche stuff, um, and then. We'll talk a little bit about shooting sports with mirrorless, um, and and then after that we'll we'll shoot a little fireworks. We'll switch gears real quick and and, and shoot a little fireworks after the game, which will be a 180 degrees from shooting action. There you go. That's well, a twofer in a way, right? Right. You got, you got absolutely two workshops rolled into one. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Um, I'll have more information about the workshop if po folks are interested. Uh, but Eric, this is this has been a great introduction to uh, Fujifilm. I mean, I, between the two of us, I think we're both sort of like uh, Fujifilm fan, fanboys in a way. Uh, uh, I get accused of that all the time. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> but I I don't care. I don't care. I'm gonna use the equipment that's really right for me, and I feel like it's really right for me. And I feel I, I believe right. you feel the same way. I mean, it's the well, it's the thing that's gonna. Is, so. What's that? So I put my money where my mouth is. There you so. go. Yeah, I mean, it's the right equipment for you, and it works for you. And uh, your your, you know, at the end of the day, your clients are thrilled with what you're producing for them, uh, and they continue to call you back and uh, keep you employed. Right? I mean, that's right. really 
the the ultimate test uh, of whatever you're producing for them. Um, anything, any any kinds of challenges though that you feel you would still like to overcome with the system that you feel like, oh, I wish Fujifilm could do this, other than the 200 f2 that's hopefully coming. I was just yeah, the the, the last piece of glass yeah. is the biggest one. Um, the other little things are are they're just little things like they're they're more post production things like I'd like to be like they well they they're, they I hear the the next firmware or did it come in the last firmware I'd have to check you can put audio files with your with your like you could with my Nikon's um, I'd like to be able to to easily tag photos so that they those showed up as tagged images in Photo Mechanic I don't think we can do that yet. But just little things like that, and that is more relating to my what I do after the camera sure. kind of stuff. As far as in camera, I'm kind of really happy where we're at. Yeah. I mean, you know, anyways, I saw this rumor on one of the other rumor sites that that Fuji's working on the, the new super camera, which I can only assume they're probably working on something to compete with the A9. And geez, if it if the next Fuji camera is half of what the A9 is, you know, in, you know, take the XT2 and add a little bit of A9 to it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Here's my money. There you yeah. go. Yep. The return on investment. I'm going to always remember that from you, Eric. Thank you. Return on investment, and that's and yeah. that really, and that just keeps hitting home, is with me because. It's just a it's just a fact you can't ignore, right. you know that that I'm getting the job done. The job can be done, can be done at a high high level, with gear that costs a quarter to a third as much. You know, in a, in a in a portion of the industry that doesn't have the pay to support it. You know, unless you're one of the handful of people in this country that live in a New York, San Francisco, Phoenix. Miami, where you've got college and pro sports all the time, and you're busy all the time, it'd be really hard to justify from a business standpoint those other major expenses, you know, Indeed. that it would take to work to use the best gear, you know. Indeed. Indeed. Well, that's great, great advice. And thanks for the tip. I really appreciate that. Uh, Eric, thanks for joining us today. I really look forward to continuing our conversation on many more Fujifilm adventures together. Take care. Absolutely. Bye. All right. Take care.